Every believer is a priest, and every believer priest has the privilege of personally preparing himself to the Word of God using rebound if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that the Word of God has been forever settled in heaven and that it stands forever as a monument to who and what you are and a monument to the revelation of who and what you are. We realize that down through the years it has be, been the source of a great deal of hatred and antagonism, a great deal of uh, uh, attack, and yet the Word of God still stands. And may God the Holy Spirit glorify God the Son as we study together this important subject in Jesus' name. Amen. The Word of God is under attack as much today as it has always been. When you go back to the turn of the century, you have men like Robert Ingersoll who uh, would travel in the country and would uh, uh, attack the Word of God, uh, would uh, attack evangelism. Today, they have infiltrated some of the great seminaries of our nation and are, have turned them into hotbeds of liberalism and uh, the area that receives attack, perhaps greater than any other, is the area of the inerrancy of Scripture, the infallibility, the inerrancy of the Word of God. There are three basic wrong attitudes toward Scripture. The first is called rationalism. And rationalism comes in three categories. There is extreme rationalism that denies any kind of a divine revelation. This is where you get your atheism or agnosticism. That is, that there is no, using the mind, coming to the conclusion, there is no revelation from God. Then there is moderate rationalism, which admits that there is some kind of uh, revelation, but admits only to the certain types of uh, revelation that their mind can comprehend uh, and that is approved. Uh, this is often called higher criticism and uh, this is the philosophy of uh, liberalism uh, also called and not so much today but in the past modernism uh, and uh, neo-orthodoxy or the new orthodoxy. There was a time, as I have somewhere in my notes, uh, uh, the uh, information about, uh, oh, here it is, yes, uh, Fuller Theological Seminary, for example, was founded uh, by Charles E. Fuller, who was a strong fundamentalist, uh, radio preacher of a previous generation, uh, very, very well known for the old-fashioned revival hour, which was carried on hundreds and hundreds of stations around the country. He was the pastor of a local church in uh, San Diego and a lot of servicemen attended and had a tremendous influence. So all these servicemen got saved and wanted to go into the ministry, so he started Fuller Theological Seminary. And Fuller Theological Seminary started out as being absolutely tremendous. One of the great uh, teachers that they were able to attract was Harold Linzel. Dr. Linzel was teaching 
in the seminary when he began to note that the seminary was drifting away from biblical inerrancy. And in 1964, he resigned from the faculty of the seminary. He later became the manager, managing editor of Christianity Today. But it was in 19... Now, keep in mind, he left in 64. In 1972, the board officially dropped inerrancy from its doctrinal statement. And so, it, it, in other words, it, he saw it before he left. That's why he left. And yet it took eight more years for it to become public that they had dropped inerrancy. And in 1976, he wrote his epical volume, The Battle for the Bible, which uh, stands even today as the great apologetic for inerrancy. But you see, he's not alone. I mean, and that seminary is not alone. Uh, when you look at some of the great seminaries of our nation, that is repeated. That's just a modern illustration of what happened uh, back in the turn of the century at Princeton Theological Seminary. At that time, Presbyterianism was the uh, a bulwark of sound doctrine and believed in, in, in inerrancy of Scripture. That says the Bible is the Word of God, and there are no errors in it. But things have changed, and you have to search around the country to find that uh, a place the, where they can, where they stand on biblical inerrancy. And even today, Fuller is accepted by the majority of evangelicals and fundamentalists as a an evangelical seminary tragic that it should be so considered when they still do not hold to the inerrancy of scripture and Charles Fuller's son Daniel Fuller became the president of the seminary and is one of the most prolific uh, antagonists to inerrancy and has written very, very uh, much, a great deal he's written on the subject of why the Bible has uh, errors. Now, they don't believe, and uh, we'll deal with the subject, uh, the, the, what they call partial inspiration. They say the Bible is inspired in, uh, when it comes to theological matters or revelational matters, but that the Bible is filled with errors when it comes to non-revelational errors. And the one that he loves to pick out and, and throw all over is that the Bible, you have to believe the Bible is an error because the Bible, in fact, quoting Jesus, said that the mustard seed is the smallest of all seeds when any botanist knows that an orchid seed is the smallest of all seeds. So the Bible, therefore, is in error. Jesus was in error. No. Jesus was not talking about orchid seeds. Orchids don't grow in the Middle East, for one thing. Secondly, you don't grow them in your garden. And he was talking about all garden variety seeds. The mustard seed is the smallest of all garden variety seeds, not the smallest of all the seeds in all the world. And the Bible needs to be taken in the time it was written and interpret in the time it was written. How could he say, well, I do know there is an orchid seed. It's like I would say to you, because something about some uh, 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 Flaccus dominicus. You don't know anything about it. Well, neither do I. I mean, maybe I know all about it. You don't know anything, and it's foreign to you. You don't understand it. But you see, this so-called moderate rationalism comes along, and through, through, the, through what they call higher criticism, they take the Bible apart. They'll say, for example, that, uh, well, even though Jesus said that Moses wrote the law, um, that is Genesis, Exodus, and Deuteronomy, there is evidence from the study of these books that it, it, that can't be true. It cannot be true. It was written actually by 
four different people. J-E-P-D is the, 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 the nomenclature. Uh, one who called God Jehovah. Uh, another who called him Elohim. You see, uh, and the, these wrote different... Uh, uh, these wrote different portions. And then, of course, uh, how in the world could Moses have written that Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains? There the Lord showed him the whole land, and, uh, uh, and Moses, the servant of the Lord, died. And uh, there in Moab, as the Lord had said, he buried him in Moab in the place opposite Beth Peor. And to this day, no one knows where his grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, was filled. How? I mean, see, Moses couldn't write about his death. Why not? Why couldn't he write about his death? If God breathed and carried him along, God could have... There's not any information there that's that unusual. He could have 